right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Goreski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live in the classrooms across North America and uh, beyond. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you will find 40, 50, even 60 live events a month uh, featuring scientists, explorers, conservationists, adventurers from all over the world who you can bring live into your classroom. So do spend some time there. And I suggest that you check out um, our Parks Canada virtual road trip. So uh, that just started yesterday with our first trip out to New Brunswick. We're gonna visit 10 national parks, historic areas, marine parks, landmarks across uh, Canada. We're going coast to coast to coast, um, meeting uh, amazing people in the parks, learning their stories, their conservation efforts. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So do slide over to our website. It's under special events, or you can find it directly here with this link, uh, Cross Canada Virtual Road Trip, and you can join in on that action with us. All right. We have a great event uh, tuned up for today. We have Dr. Uh, Barbara Frey joining us today. She uh, is pretty darn lucky. She knew from an early age that she wanted to be a scientist, and she knew uh, from looking around at a rapidly changing world that she wanted to help protect uh, wildlife. So today she's gonna share a little bit of uh, her journey with us. Uh, all kinds of exciting things, a decade as a field ecologist, co-founding a bird banding uh, station, tackling her fear of math, which I think uh, is something that a lot of students do have, but uh, you'll find that math is something very, very important uh, for scientists, for field biologists. So as a quantitative wildlife biologist, biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service, uh, she's definitely using her math uh, as she explores uh, and informs policy decisions around the management of migratory birds in Canada uh, and beyond. So I'm going to bring Barbara in with us. Barbara, it is so great to have you joining us live from Montreal today. We're so excited to dive a little bit into your world and learn uh, a bit about the great work that you get to do. Well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm a big fan of Explore by the Sea of Your Pants. Um, my two nephews, shout out to Alex and Ben, upcoming stars in entomology and um, ecology are, I've learned tons. So I'm really excited to be here. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. I do wanna give a shout out to YouTube. I can see the comments exploding right now. Uh, so those who are joining right now, take a second to introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're tuning in from, but then leave the chat after that just for questions. We don't wanna have to mute anybody today. We wanna make sure everybody gets their questions in. A huge shout out to our camera classrooms. We're excited to get a few live classrooms, but uh, Barbara, I'm gonna throw things to you. If you wanna share your screen, I'll let you take over for a bit. Excellent. So it's rolling. We got it, we're ready. All right, so thank you for that great intro, Joe. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking in the broadly about conservation and rapidly changing world. So. As already mentioned, I grew up loving the world around me and exploring it from a young age. And I decided I wanted to be a biologist. And so I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my story about how I got here today, some of my experience and stories of being a detective in ecology and for species at risk in the field. And I'm gonna add a little couple of questions throughout. So there'll be three short questions. And if there's time to type in your answers, I'm gonna pause briefly. And if not, don't worry, there'll be a lot of chance for questions at the end. So who am I? I'm a scientist. Um, I have a doctorate, which means I went to school for a really long time, but I strongly believe you don't have to do that to be a scientist. If you're asking any questions about the world around you or about yourself, you are a scientist. I'm a mom, I'm a bird bander, I run a bird banding station, and I've been in ecology and in the field with birds for a long, long time. So after I finished high school, I only want to be a biologist, which means I needed to go to undergrad for doing a bachelor's of science. And I started to go to Carleton University. And in my first year there, I was pretty overwhelmed by everything I was learning. A lot of textbooks, a lot of labs, a lot of papers. And while it was interesting, I felt like something was missing. I already wanted to get out there. I was anxious to start and start making a difference. And I couldn't see kind of how what I was learning might connect to the real world. And I was walking down the hall one day when I saw a poster and it said, do you like ducklings? I thought, well, yes, yeah, I do like ducklings. I mean, who doesn't like ducklings? But it was an advertisement to be a field assistant in a research project, which I didn't know about. So I spent that summer, which was one of the happiest yet dirtiest summers of my life, 
in chest waders wading through ponds and wetlands and even sewage lagoons, which are pretty much as stinky as they sound in Eastern Ontario. And I just fell in love with this idea that I was collecting data that was gonna help make decisions about wetland species, such as wood ducks and red-winged blackbirds, how they were nesting, how they were doing, and how we could best manage and protect them. So I became determined that that's what I wanted to do when I finished university. So I finished my bachelor's and I went on to McGill University to do both my master's and my PhD. So that's graduate research time. So that's, you continue to be a student, but you're really hands-on. You're doing the research and you're learning as you go. Now, I wanted to make the biggest difference I could, and I wanted to make difference that was really needed at that moment in time. So I decided I wanted to work with species at risk. So get ready, here's the first question coming. What is a species at risk? And my next follow-up is just, can you think of any species at risk? So I'm just gonna pause, and Joe, you can see in if any of things are coming in. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're tuning in live via YouTube, type an answer in for us uh, in the chat sidebar. If you're joining us on camera, one of the educators and your student sends a good answer in, just pop it in the private chat uh, and we'll work some of those in. But uh, we're going to give a few seconds because there's a small delay on YouTube and we'll see if we get a few answers in uh, to those questions. So what is a species at risk and can you think of any species at risk? I'm interested to see what's going to come in here. Uh, well, I got Tiger pop in right away uh, on YouTube. So that definitely, I think that's a good fit. Yeah, that is a species at risk. Panda coming in from Miss Huxley's group. That's definitely a species at risk. Oh, more comments popping in via YouTube. Species at risk are animals that are endangered. That's from the angry triplet. Polar bears, <laughs> Persian lion, monarch butterflies. Ooh, uh, good so answers. Good answers coming in. Endangered species. So their answer to the first one is endangered species. And then they're saying orcas, gray fox, polar bears, narwhals. Uh, that's great. Oh, lots of comments coming in. Let's see. Uh, animals at risk of going extinct. So yeah, lots of great. Uh, uh, Charlotte says close to going extinct like the panda. I think we're getting some good answers there. Yeah, basically you guys are hitting all the right answers and great examples. So a species at risk is typically a plant or animal that's at risk of disappearing or going extinct. So exactly right. Round of applause. So here in Canada, um, there's four different kind of categories that you can have a species at risk. So scientists and experts come together and decide whether a species is at risk, and then it gets put in these one of these four categories, special concern, threatened, endangered, or extirpated. And then if it goes all the way up, it's extinct. So that means it no longer exists anywhere in the world. And that's a really sad, sad when that happens. So those are some great examples of different species, some of those from Canada, some of those from around the world, and they can fit in those different categories. So here in Canada, there's over 600 species of plants and animals that are listed by COSIWIC, which is that independent group that makes that decision. And once they're listed, they're protected under SARA, which is a Species at Risk Act. And in the United States, you have Endangered Species Act, and different countries have these different laws to protect a species. So this is a good thing when it happens, but a sad thing when it happens, because it means we need to protect them because they're getting that rare. So that's what I decided I wanted to work on. I wanted to work with these species that were in trouble. So I thought, well, in order to find those species, I'm gonna to have to go to the high Arctic or the tropics. I'm gonna to need to go to these far off exotic places. And I was really surprised when I discovered that in Canada, most of the species at risk are pretty much in my backyard. So this is a map where in red, you can see is the highest numbers of species at risk in the country. And they're often where a lot of people are. So there's two reasons that the species at risk are highest in that southern area. One is because Canada's pretty chilly. So our greatest biodiversity and greatest diversity of habitats overall is at the southern edge. But the second and more important reason is because these are the areas that are mostly modified or influenced by human presence. And sometimes us humans can make it pretty difficult for species to survive and live in these areas. So I didn't need to go far to find species at risk. I also decided that I want to work with birds. First of all, I, I kind of fell in love with them. They're really neat. They're these neat indicators of biodiversity in general. They, they are found in so many different places of interest in ecology, but also because a lot of them are disappearing really quickly. So I think earlier this year, my colleague Adam Spiss presented some of his work on this paper, which showed that in 50 years, we've lost 3 
billion birds. So we have 3 billion birds less, almost 2.9, than we, we had 50 years ago, which is a huge decrease. And some of the species that are declining the fastest are the grassland bird species. So you can see on the all the way over the right in that in that picture, which is minus 53. And that second chart at the bottom, you see this says grassland birds and also aerial insectivores. So aerial insectivores are birds that catch insects that are flying in the air. So that led me to want to work with these two beautiful species. I'm a bit biased, but these guys are really cool. The bobolink on the left, which looks like it's wearing a backwards tuxedo, and the red-headed woodpecker on the right. Now the bobolink is basically the poster child for grassland birds. Over 80 to 90 percent of it, this the population has declined over time, similar for the red-headed woodpecker. And red-headed woodpecker, even though it's a woodpecker and it pecks on wood, it flies out to catch a lot of the insects. So it's in a way an aerial insectivore. And what also really interested me is these were not naturally rare. These are once really common birds and they're now disappearing. And that can have a huge ecological effect when you have a lot of a spe of a of an individual species and they decline, there's a lot of different things that are going to interact with that species and it's going to happen. So now it's my turn to the story about the bobolink. So the bobolink is this great bird. Um, it sounds a little bit like our d from Star Wars. It goes bloop, bloop, bloop. So it's beautiful to wake up early in the morning and go out and see these in the hayfields. It's also a long distance migrant. So this map here is brought by eBird, which is a really fantastic group that does citizen science or community science collects, um, um, people can send in their observations from all over the world and they, they do fantastic data visualization with it. So in the winter, this species is found in the pampas of, of South America. And then as summer comes, they move up and they fly and nest into Eastern North America and then they go back down again in the winter. So it's a long distance migrant. Now they used to go to the tall grass prairies, which is a habitat that existed 200 years ago, but is now pretty much gone. So they're found in other grassy areas or anthropogenic habitats. And anthropogenic habitats are habitats that are created and modified by humans. So they're found in hay fields and grassland and pastures, anything big grassy areas. Now, the bobolink comes from its long trip from South America and it needs to find a place to nest. And it wants to put its nest in the safest place possible because its babies are right on the ground in a little cup. So it's evolved and adapted over centuries to learn where's the best place to put that nest so that it's successful and its babies can grow up strong and healthy. Now it knows it needs to stay far away from the forests or trees because that's where predators such as raccoons and skunks will come and sniff that tasty treat and eat their babies. It's also learned that it needs quite a bit of overhead protection and cover from attack from the sky, such as from the northern harrier or other hawks. So based on this learning and adaptation over years, it chooses that best spot to place its nest. So it should be able to raise its young. That's when the unexpected happens in this rapidly changing world that we're living in. There's a big change that happens, which it cannot find clues for in the landscape. We are cut grass or we let cattle in or we change the environment in such a way that is really destructive. I mean, when this happens, basically the nest is completely destroyed and the young are killed and the birds have to fly all the way back to Argentina without having been successful. And the worst part is it can't predict it. There's no clues that it's adapted to to discover which one of these two hay fields is going to be cut and those lose all its babies and which one won't. So that's when maladaptive habitat use comes. So here's my next question. Kind of getting some clues, but what do you think maladaptive means? All right, that's a good one. So we'll give a minute for our camera classrooms to pop something in the private chat. Uh, those on YouTube will get that question very shortly and we'll let them start to put that in. So maladaptive, what do you think that means? Loving the participation so far, Barbara. Have tons of uh, answers coming in via the chat, so that's great. Well, we do wait for a couple answers. Let me zip back up to the top of the chat. I'm gonna give a few shout outs to some classrooms who already introduced themselves. Um, let's see. There we go. So we've got some a grade five class hanging out with us. We've got um, some grade twos hanging out with us in Ontario, some seventh graders. Um, lots in the chat. It's hard to kind of get it to hold still so I can read out some of these classroom 
uh, names who are joining us. So that's great. Uh, if you haven't introduced your class and you're an educator, please do take a moment to do so in the chat. Oh, seventh graders, virtual East Elementary in Oakville. Good stuff. Okay, so a few answers coming in here. Maladaptive, not good enough for animals to live. Um, others are saying not adequate uh, or appropriate adjustment to the environment or the situation. It means mm -hmm. animals aren't getting the good stuff that they need is another one there. They're not adjusting properly. Um, from our live groups, uh, Khalid thinks maybe having trouble adapting, unable to live in its uh, natural environment. That's from Ms. Huey's group. Um, let's see. Yeah, they can't find a new habitat. It's another thought. So lots of good thoughts. What, what do you think, Barbara? These are excellent. Great job, guys. You have hit it on the head. Maladaptive. I like to say it when good species make bad choices. So um, adaptive habitat use be the example that I used of over centuries, the species evolving to notice that, hmm, if I nest near the forest, those raccoons are gonna eat my baby. So I'm gonna move away from the forest. That's a good choice. These species are making bad choices. That's exactly right. They're unable to make correct their behavior for uh, to, to be able to um, adapt and live in the situation. I think the people in the chat actually said that better than I did. So it's exactly right. They're not able to clue in that the hay field's going to be cut or that the cows are gonna be let in the pasture. So they keep returning to places where they actually do worsen. And then that happens, that's called an ecological trap. And as a conservation biologist, that's really scary when that happens because it's really difficult. There's nothing that species can seem to do, at least in the short time frame. You know, maybe it's only been 50 years that the hay's been cut earlier, but that species has disappeared by 90% in that 50 years. It's gonna have a really hard time to catch up. So moving on, it's the next story about the red-headed woodpecker, which also has a bit of a sad, similar story. So the red-headed woodpeckers, which is, you know, this is what Woody Woodpecker is based off of the cartoon, um, used to be found in these, these beautiful open tree areas called savannas or other um, lightly treed areas with small understory. So it was perfect for these species. They had the wood that they could nest in, they had these big open areas, sometimes wet spots that they go and could fly catch and get the insects. Dream redhead woodpecker habitat land. Unfortunately, these have also completely, almost completely disappeared through human use, because also it's a really nice place for humans to live in and to, to um, have agriculture in. And they've moved into another anthropogenic habitat. These are golf courses, city parks, other urban areas which have short grass or not a lot of shrubs and these tall trees that they can live in. But there's somebody else that has moved into these areas. There's an invasive species called the European starling. And the European starling needs to nest in holes, but it's not a woodpecker. It can't make its own holes. So what does it do? Well, it tends to choose the same habitat that the red-headed woodpecker is now choosing, which means there's a lot of aggression between the two and that they often steal their red-headed woodpecker's nests. And even if they don't steal them, sometimes they agitate them enough that they just don't do that well in those areas. It's not the only thing that's happening wrong with the redhead. Something that my research showed when I worked with them for two years in Eastern and Southern Ontario is that they're just don't seem to be making enough babies. They're laying the eggs, but not enough young are coming out to replace the population, which means they have low fecundity. And whether this has to do with the changing climate or pesticides or other chemicals that is affecting the flying insect population, these guys are just not doing well. And actually, so I published this data, which is often what scientists like myself do. We publish them in scientific reports so that the information can get out there. And it's also questioned by other experts to make sure it's robust or that we have the right information. And then the group that decides when a species at risk is in Canada, the COSIWA groups, they do it every 10 years. They do basically a checkup or a status update to see how that species is doing. And I was fortunate enough that when I finished my PhD work on this species, I was considered the expert of the species in Canada, and I was chosen to write up this status update. And based on the information that I found in the field, as well as the status update, the species was actually uplisted to endangered. So it went to the highest category of risk in 2018 or 2019, the decision was made, um, which was a really proud and a really sad moment for me. It was one of the really bigger than any fancy paper or any big talk that I'd give. I found that the information that I found in nature actually led to uh, the protection and laws being changed to protect a species. But it's also really sad for me because that's a sad 
ending for my story of the redheads and that they're listed now in endangered, but that does give them the highest level of protection and possible in Canada. Now I'm gonna go for a little different story. Often as scientists, when we're talking about our research, we talk about things that go right because, well, we'd like to talk about them because it's a good feeling. And it's also often where some of our most exciting findings come out of. But that does give you the idea that mostly things go right. And that's not the case. Sometimes it's a really small percent of the time that we get things right. And we have to go down a lot of wrong roads and difficult moments to find our right way. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about one of the times I went down a wrong and difficult road. And that was my story of being a rusty blackbird detective. So this species here, which I think is a very handsome species, is a close cousin to the bobolink. It's in the blackbird family. And I do like blackbirds because they got attitude for birds. And it's called rusty because it has that beautiful rusty color on it during the breeding season. Again, it's a species that used to be really common and is disappearing. Again, almost a 90% decline. And we don't know why. And there's very little research that's been done on this bird, especially when I was trying to do this research about eight years ago, because they nest really at the tippity tippity top of um, treed and untreed areas in Canada and these string bogs in Alaska and Northern Canada. You can see on the red there in the map, that's where they're found. There's not a lot of roads up there, so it's really tricky to get there, but I wasn't gonna give up. I heard that there was a um, small population in Algonquin Park in Ontario. So I decided I was gonna spend a summer there to find them. So I got myself a big red truck, in a canoe and I spent almost three months, almost every day, 12 hours a day, getting up at four in the morning, coming back to the field camp at six o'clock at night, looking for these birds in all conditions. Did I find them? I did. Some, some of them, some, some males and some females in the top left corner, you see the black and the gray. I even caught some in what's called mist nets, which I do have a permit to do and I'm very careful when I do it. I found nests. I even found some babies and I abandoned them. But it was a pretty tough slog. It was cold. It was hot. It was very, very buggy. I donated a lot of blood to the ecological food web that year. There's also other species that were in the park that I had to be careful for. And then out of all those pictures, it's actually the bottom right hand side where I was the most scared. You can't tell in that picture, but I am soaking wet because I fell through a bog. Falling through a bog mat is a little bit like falling through ice, where if you fall through, the bog can close up after you. I was lucky. I just got really soaked, but it did make me nervous. So that was a tricky time. And after all that time, I only found four nests. Now, that's a problem with working with a species at risk. It can be really, really tricky to find them. And you do mathematically and statistically need to find enough so that the answers that you find to your questions, you know, are the right ones. But I wasn't going to give up that easy. Okay, I thought, I just didn't go high up north enough. So how was I going to get up there? There's no roads, but there's planes and helicopters. And because I was a bird bander, I could volunteer to be a goose bander with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. So I drove from Montreal 12 hours up to Timmins, and then I flew up to Moosonee, and I flew up to Attawapiskat, and then I flew up to Pawanek, which is in Polar Bear Provincial Park. And it's 200 people, isolated, flying only, community, which had an office there for scientists to go. And I banded snow geese and Canada geese, which means I got to really neat experience banding geese, going out, um, getting to see some caribou and seeing some polar bears from the helicopter. And I could see the string bogs. So that upper right hand corner picture, that's where I thought those rusties were. But I couldn't get there. And I couldn't ask the helicopter to stop because Helicopters up that far north, you're talking five, six thousand dollars an hour, and that would have blown through my budget really fast. So instead I thought, well, I'm gonna see if I can find them on foot. In the evenings after I was finished my goose banding, I would go back to the to um our the the park office, which is pictured there, and I'd walk out on the tree up lines. And you can tell in the picture on the right, I'm pretty miserable. Black flies are really bad. The slogging was really hard. I wasn't finding any rusty blackbirds. And then one day I scared myself because I found some polar bear tracks in the mud and I realized I was not being safe and I was not being smart. And that was when I realized that for what I had to try to accomplish and the logistics involved was just not gonna happen. So that was my failed story of trying to be a rusty blackbird detective. And my story of learning how sometimes research just doesn't go as you planned it to.
And that's a really important lesson to learn anywhere in life. And now my last bit that I want to talk to you about is my current job. So I'm a public servant in Canada and I'm working in the Environment and Climate Change Canada in the Canadian Wildlife Service. And there, my job is to protect and manage migratory birds, species at risk, and their naturally important habitats. Which is really neat because that means questions come to me and I get to be a detective and try to help figure them out. So here's my last question. Often I have to deal with threats and understanding threats to migratory birds. So what do you think are some of the major threats to migratory birds? All right, we will open that up to the chat. We'll open that up to our camera classrooms in the private chat. So let's hear what we're thinking. What are some major threats to migratory birds? So those birds that leave us in the winter and come back, uh, well, nicer times like now. Yeah. Oh, I got a big one, light, climate change. That's coming in via the uh, YouTube chat. So those are two really good ones. We've got a couple coming in via our camera classrooms. Climate change from uh, Ms. Huxley's grade six class, or sorry, Ms. Huey's class, grade six class. Yeah, Anna in uh, uh, Mrs. Stangoli's class is definitely saying climate change, predators, winter, humans. I think we've got some good ones there. Yeah, plastic. these are some plastic. Ooh, you guys are hitting. This is a winning class. A's all around. <laughs> yeah, so these are some of the major threats for birds in Canada, as um, said by Birds Canada, which is a really great NGO. And they listed five major threats. So you hit on pretty much all of them, I think. So we have habitat loss, pesticides and contaminants, invasive species, and cats. Shout out. If you have a cat, please, 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 please kill it inside. They kill millions, if not billions, of birds every year. Um, collisions, whether it's windows or hydroelectric towers, and climate crisis or the climate change. So from my story so far, I've talked a little bit about the bobolink, the habitat loss, and invasive species with the redhead woodpeckers. And the last bit I'm going to hit on is climate change, which is a biggie, especially when it comes to bird migration, which is what migratory birds do. So birds have what are called flyways. So these are pathways that they fly up and down. So they're smart. They go mostly south. Some go really far south and some just go south enough um, to avoid some snow. And some, some actually come down into the snow in Canada, like in Montreal at Red Poles that come here for their winter vacation in the nice warm, balmy Montreal winter and then go high up in the Arctic again. But for a lot of species, um, excuse me, for a, in a lot of places, you'll see waterfowl that are migrating. For me, that's really emblematic in spring. I heard my first Canada geese go overhead today and that made me really excited. So in spring and fall, you see these large groups of waterfowl going up and down these flyways. And one of the first questions that came across my desk was from some hunters and bird watchers in Southern United States, which said, hey, where did all the ducks go? They said, we used to see them around in October, November, and we're seeing just a really small portion of the numbers we used to see what is happening. And that led me scratching my head because this is a chart again that shows species, species groups decline. So the ones kind of on the bottom half are the ones that are in trouble and the ones that are on the top half are doing fine. The waterfowl, we're doing pretty fine, I thought. We've been doing kind of good with waterfowl. Not specifically because we adjusted what we did with them, but we've been protecting wetlands more and more in the last 30 to 40 years. Okay, but the people down south aren't seeing them that much in the fall. So I got out my detective glass and I tried to figure out what was happening. Well, I knew species such as mallards, they, you know, they spend their winters in the southern U.S. and then they move up north into Canada and the northern United States to breed and then they go back down slowly again. So they're much faster when they go up spring, they're maybe more excited and then the fall they go down slower. But at the same time, we've been hearing more and more results about some ducks staying much longer in the winter or even overwintering in some places, which they hadn't done before. Now this is a big question covered a lot of species, a lot of years, and a lot of space. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't jump in my big red truck or get into my canoe and go and collect data like this. But I could use community or citizen science data. So there's groups uh, that collect this data, like Quebec Oiseau in the EPOC database or the eBird database that collect tens, decades of years of data put in by bird watchers like you and me that go into this fantastic database. 
And I also knew these would be climate maps that let us look at how the climate's been changing over time. And now I had to face one of my last fears, math. I liked math in that it got me answers to questions, but I was never really a math brain. But I discovered that sometimes you have to do what's scary in order to do what you love. And for me, that was getting into statistics and mathematical models. And that wasn't quite as scary as facing the bogs and the black flies in Ontario, but it's really close. But it got me to get answers. And I started to be able to make these big mathematical models and equations and looking at climate change. And I made some pretty neat discoveries. What I found is as the temperature was changing around us, especially the warmer falls, the geese and the ducks were staying later. How much later? Well, sometimes up to a month later than they used to. And that's why the people down south weren't seeing them. They were just staying up north. Now, is this really a bad thing that they're just hanging out, staying where it's warmer, having a vacation? Just because the hunters were worried, is that really a bad thing? Well, it's not that they're just staying longer. They were sometimes going to completely different places. In this little animation, look for the yellow. And that's what's happening the last 20 years. What's happening in the green and the purple is what's happening in the previous decades. And the main lesson to learn here, if you can see it animating, is that yellow bubble up in kind of the Washington and Oregon State area, is we have some birds in the last 20 years that are not only staying up north, but they're going to a completely different place than they went before. Again, is this really a problem? It is when we consider things like just food webs, that these species are all interconnected. And when there's something big that's changing, like the timing of migration or where they're going, that can have a cascading effect, something that we might not see yet, but it's a warning of something that we can see in the future. Um, and there's species such as the Arctic fox there that relies heavily on species like snow geese, which are one of the species that are delaying their migration and changing where they're going and how, when they're going. And there's also the human element. You know, hunting and harvesting waterfowl is a huge cultural, social, uh, economic portion, especially to indigenous communities up north. So these were all important things for me to consider. And this is a question I haven't finished answering. My detective hat is still on and I'm still working on that today. So that's a little bit about my story about what I've done. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with one final message that says, if you take care of birds, you take care of most of the environmental problems in the world by Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. I don't know if that's always the right answer, but it's not a bad place to start. All right. Awesome. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for those great stories, for taking us a little bit uh, into your world and of course, sharing failures, right? We all like to share the good stuff that happens, but uh, I think we all know that we make mistakes. Things always don't work out. And it's what we do after that. That's important. How we use that. Very, very cool. All right. Well, let's get into some Q&A action. I'm going to start bringing in some of our classrooms. Uh, let's start with Miss Huxley's fourth fifth graders in Caledon, Ontario. Let's bring her in. There we go. How are we doing, Ms. Huxley? Uh, we're doing great. We had some, uh, I'm sorry, we had some great uh, ideas for your earlier questions. And I'm just looking to see if they're, okay, they're, they're helping me here. Um, <laughs> did you ever find a bird running away from their habitat? So, totally moving from one habitat to a different type of habitat? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there are cases where you do have, and I'm trying to think of examples, uh, you do have cases where you have species that are, are changing. Hmm. They're often moving to what we call anthropogenic habitats. So the habitats that are completely different and they're man-made I mean, such as the hay fields, they didn't exist. And then they're, they're moving to this because superficially or on the surface, it looks like what they need. And then they start using that habitat. And sometimes they realize, oh, this isn't happening. Um, you know, an example is it's, it's a short-term habitat use, but you have um, when the oil is being processed, they create these big water reservoirs and you have problems where you have ducks landing in this because it looks like a nice big pond but actually when they land in that they get stuck and they can't go anywhere uh, which is really really sad when it happens so that's like the ultimate ecological trap because it looks great and it causes almost immediate death um 
So you do have a lot of these species that are moving over to these anthropogenic habitats. And sometimes you have success stories and sometimes you find solutions where it works really well. And but often there's there's something that can be tricky and that might come out in a couple of years or in a couple of decades. OK, great question to get us started. Thanks so much uh, to our grade four or fives. Uh, let's see, Miss. Huey is joining us. They are grade sixes, Hamilton, Ontario. Let's see if we can bring uh, them in with us. Oh, well, actually, I don't. Oh, they were there to start, but maybe they dropped out. So we'll switch gears. Uh, we'll see if they're able to come back in and join us. We're going to go now to Toronto. We've got some grade sixes uh, with Miss Stangola. So let's bring uh, her nice front center. There we go. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? Her very informative presentation. Um, I've got a number of questions here from students. Uh, what was the most interesting animal species that you've uh, investigated and why? And what were three unique features of that species? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> okay, well, for me, I really enjoyed working the red headed woodpecker. Um, it it used to be found in Quebec, where I'm from, and it was extirpated. So that's when it, the species goes locally extinct. So for me, to I moved over to Ontario and I could start studying and then I found it. Three things that are really neat about this woodpecker. One is that um, if you think of woodpeckers, they're these big, clunky, they have that big bill. They're not the best at flight compared to a swallow. They're kind of like look like a dinosaur. And to see them go out and catch these insects on the wing, which means they go out and they catch them, was really neat to see. There are also a species that is one of the few species that caches its food. So they would have these secret spots that it goes and it, it, it saves its food for later. And they could actually handle an insect so delicately that it would stick it in a crevice, um, still alive, and it would come back for it later and they would cover it up. Um, and they also had this really neat way of communicating and sometimes they would um, have several of them within an area, much less now that I could see just because they're so rare, but that they would have this community and they would communicate together back and forth and they had this really shrill call. And they would go and find the highest point and the hardest wood to go knock on. And it was like their signal. So they really made a great use of their habitat. They had their home, they had their place where they went to go get their food, and they had their place where they would cache their food. And then they had basically their doorbell, which they would go knock on when they really wanted to make a lot of noise. So for me, you know, I didn't get a chance to go to tropical areas and work with things like tigers and rhinoceros. But for me, that was a really neat way to watch a species. I love just watching species behavior and they had a lot of attitude. Sounds like it, really cool. I can see how they could be an inspiration for Woody Woodpecker because he's he's got some <laughs> attitude too. So I see how that's uh, a pretty good fit. Awesome. Uh, I wanna bring in uh, Ms. Kenerva here. She is representing her environment and resource management uh, class in Scarborough. So let me uh pop her in here how we doing we're great thank you how are you guys doing great good 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 um, awesome to have your crew with us yeah so we're environment and resource management we've been looking at the anthropocene uh in our last few classes so a uh, question for you is how do you think uh the future of birds looks if we don't actually take the steps we need to stop those tipping points Great, great question. Um, I am the eternal optimist, which is a rarity in the field of conservation biology, but I do believe we have the potential to wind back when it comes to birds. The big thing is climate change. You know, obviously that that is the arbor arching umbrella that is going to affect all of us. So sometimes in a way we can't go beyond just talking about a single species or a single organism or habitat without tackling that. But aside from that, birds are resilient. Um, a lot of bird species are dynamic and they're flexible. So I think we can do a lot of good. And there's some really simple solutions that we can, we can do. I mean, some of the big things, <laughs> like again, I said, just keeping your cats inside. Cats can kill up to 3 billion birds a year in the United States alone, 100 67 million in Canada alone. 
um, cats actually kill more birds per year than window collision, pesticides, um, harvest like hunters, um, all these things put together. So, you know, in a way that's a really easy solution to make a big difference for a lot of bird species. And the more we learn, we have the capability to shape our environment. And I really believe that there is a place for species and humans to coexist on the planet. So I'm hopeful. And I think there's lots of good things we can do. All right, it is good to have that hope. Uh, and you're right, that's that, you know, that is the beautiful thing about a lot of species uh, and habitats is given space, they are resilient and they can uh, bounce back and quickly in a lot of cases, but it's, it's giving them that space, that protection in the first place uh, that they really, really need. Um, okay, I wanna introduce a class who's joining us. They're a grade five, six class uh, joining us. They are with us in the call, um, but uh, they're not right on, on screen with us. So they sent in a really good question here uh, in the chat. And uh, this question also came from another group online. Uh, Mrs. Barreto de Souza's class, grade seven and eight uh, in Scarborough. And they're really wondering, you mentioned cats is, you know, one solution, keep cats inside, but is there something students can do at a student level? Maybe you're in elementary school, maybe uh, you're in high school. Is there something uh, that we can do to help birds? Great question. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's different things. So one thing that my five-year-old helps me with is you get out a highlighter, yellow one's good, you open it, you go to your windows and you mark it. There's ultraviolet in here, birds can see an ultraviolet. And especially if you make it look like a spider web, that's gonna be something that a bird's gonna wanna avoid, naturally speaking, because they don't like to get in the spider webs, it gets all over their feather, messes them up. That will keep birds from flying into windows. It's easy to do, it doesn't hurt your window, you do it every once in a while, and it's gonna help stop bird collisions. And that is something that you can do right from your own home. Um, you can plant natural plants. If you have parents that drink coffee, ask them to drink shade-grown coffee. It actually makes a really big difference for a lot of the birds that we see here, like rose-breasted grosbeak, which is a really beautiful cousin of a cardinal. Um, and they go and they live down in the, the tropical areas in the winter, and having shade-grown coffee makes a huge difference as a habitat. Again, an anthropogenic habitat, but a good anthropogenic habitat for them to live in. Um, you can reduce plastic waste. I think a colleague of mine, Jennifer Provencher, did a whole bit about seabirds and plastic pollution. It's a huge, huge problem. Don't use plastic straws. Um, just try to reduce plastic in your life. Um, avoid supporting places that use pesticides. And go out and do citizen science. You guys can report birds to eBird. And that makes a huge difference. People like me are making are helping to make big decisions to learn about birds by you going to your phone, using iNaturalist, Bumble, uh, Bumblebee Watch, um, eButterfly, eBird, all these things. We use that data and we make really important, um, they help us make really important decisions. Okay, that was a ton of really good options. <laughs> uh, you know, recently we had someone join us from uh, Birds in the City and talked about uh, you know, those people see those pay, those outlines of the, the falcons or, or the hawks and, and actually, you know, maybe in that one portion of the window, it's a good, but birds, you know, are fast and agile. And so they'll just, you know, kind of duck over. So that big coverage of the window is, is really effective. Yeah. Very cool. It really, really works. Okay. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. We'll check in quickly with Ms. Huxley's crew and see if they have one. Okay. My... You talked about uh, the Easter or the European starling, I think it was the European yeah. starling, as being kind of like an invasive species uh, of bird that are threatening local or natural birds in Canada. Is there any other species that has that kind of impact on birds in Canada? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so there are other invasive species. Luckily in North America, you know, don't go talking to Australians because they've, they've had a really rough time when it comes to invasive species like the, the cane toad and things like that. Here we, we kind of started learning our lesson that, that bringing species over was a bad thing. So we don't have, um, you know, and actually in, in Hawaii, there's been tons of birds that were decimated by, um, by snakes being brought over. 
here at mainland, some invasive species that pop into my head, it doesn't think of it, but the emerald ash borer is an insect that goes and kills off ash trees. And when this happens, it's not directly affecting the bird as in it's climbing on the bird's back and hurting it, but it's taking out mature trees really quickly in the landscape. Like here in Montreal, um, in my daughter's playground, they had to take out 30 of the biggest trees due to emerald ash borers. And that has an immediate effect in the canopy and the homes that it makes for birds. So species like that, anything that changes the landscape drastically can affect birds and other species down the line. Okay, uh, let's go back to our RH King Academy and see if they have a follow-up. All right, um, final question then. Do you think birds are more or less susceptible than other groups of species to the damages that humans cause? Oh, good question. Hmm. Um, I think birds have the potential, I'm gonna be really wishy-washy with this one, but it does make sense in my mind, have the potential to be more flexible and more vulnerable at the, at the same time to the changes that human makes. Birds can fly. And that's why they've conquered almost every continent, every habitat in the world. I mean, that's why we have the boreal forest, which actually has, it's a huge, huge habitat. And there's, we call it the duck factory and the songbird factory, because they have the ability to go there when it's good and leave when it gets too harsh in the winter. And that's why you don't have as many mammals up in the boreal forest or in the Arctic regions, because birds have the ability to fly. So they can move as opposed to a tree you know if something is had this tree only grows in this one place and something's happening in that one place it doesn't have the ability to move but that flexibility to move um, and migration especially makes birds extra vulnerable sometimes to changes such as climate change where they have all these these intrinsic triggers that um, modify their behavior like some birds um, they leave down in their wintering grounds based on the sun so when the sun, when the days get long enough, that's their trigger, they go. They don't know what is happening up north. They have that trigger that I'm gonna leave now, I'm gonna go. And when they get there, it can be completely different. So we have birds that are leaving at the same time that they have for thousands of years due to the trigger of the sun. When they're getting up north, spring's already been there a week or a month earlier than before. Most of the insects that they usually eat are already gone and they come here and they starve or their babies starve. So they have the flexibility, but they also have these ecological traps that they can fall into. Okay, and I wanna visit uh, Ms. Stengel's group one more time, just in case they have another one. I know one of yours was stolen when we asked about the- Yes, about, how citizens, can help. about citizen science and what um, younger students, you know, 11 and 12 year olds could do to make a difference. Um, but we still have one other question. Uh, you mentioned that the woodpecker, um, their status has changed, uh, has been upgraded to an endangered status. If that uh, particular bird became extinct, would it have an impact on other bird species? That's a great question. So um, yes, it's very rare that a species goes extinct and has very little effect to the world around it. For a species such as the red-headed woodpecker, I think one of the major changes it would have is the, the holes that it makes. And so it's not only the European starling, which was that invasive species that I mentioned that goes and uses its holes. It tries to use its holes when the redhead is already there, which is a bit of a problem. But woodpeckers actually, just like we have a food web, we also have a nest web. And that just means an interaction between different species using the same resources. So red-headed woodpeckers, when they make their hole, that hole, they won't use it the next year, but it'll still be there in the environment, which means it's a hole for species such as chickadees to go in. Or, and, and we found all sorts of creatures use woodpecker holes. It can be um, mammals, it could be bats, it could even be snakes, it could be bees. So once we start pulling, I always think of it as a, as a block of Jenga. You know, when you start pulling those pieces out, and if you don't know what Jenga is, please go play it, by the way, maybe I'm just old. Um, it, that tower becomes unstable. And that's the problem when you're removing species. Sometimes it's not that individual species, but it, it, it adds instability or problems to make that tower start wavering. And it just makes it more likely that everything's gonna fall apart. So we never know what's gonna happen until we start pulling those blocks. <laughs> we don't wanna try that. No, no, not a good experiment to play with ecosystems. And especially since we depend so much on biodiversity for 
countless things, everything we use in our everyday life, biodiversity is pretty uh, darn important for us. Barbara, I want to start off with a huge shout out to all the classrooms on YouTube. Thank you for sending in all the great questions. Uh, a big shout out to our, our camera crew. Thank you to the classrooms who joined us there today and the questions. And Barbara, uh, just a great presentation. Thanks for sharing a little bit of your story uh, and you know just what it means to, to be protecting and conserving uh, birds and a little bit of life as a biologist. Very cool. And I just want to invite anyone, if you Google my name, you'll find me online, you'll find my website, you'll find my email address, please. And on Twitter, I'm Barbara Link. Please don't hesitate to shout out and ask me any more questions. I'm always happy to hear them. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a tremendous weekend. Like I said, head to explorebytheseat.com to find just a crazy number of events coming up uh, over the next few weeks. We're looking forward to seeing your classrooms again. Thanks, everyone. Bye.